give you a scenario. So we've all been, in most cases, promoted to be the manager of the Coles branch on Elizabeth Street. So just next to Flinders Street Station, the Coles. And your job, obviously, as the manager of Coles is to sell as many things as you can. So where do you place the shopping baskets? Where do you place the shopping baskets for your supermarket? Anyone? Just want to yell it out? At the front. Okay. Usual response, if you walk into most supermarkets, the baskets are at the front. Let me give you another scenario. You're rushing home tonight to Flinders Street Station and you need to grab a pizza for tea. And you go, I don't need a basket, just need a pizza, I can carry a pizza. Um, so you rush in, you grab the pizza, and then you see that the rocket's on special. So it'd be great to have the rocket with the pizza. So now you've got two things in your hands. And then you see that the drinks are also on special. And it'd be great to have a drink with your pizza and your rocket. As a store owner, do you think it's a good place that your customer has their hands full? No. no. So where do you place the baskets? Yeah, Throughout the store. Whereabouts in the store? Everywhere? How do you know it's the right place? You've got to balance the cost of that, the space it takes up that's not product is. Where do you put the baskets? <laughs> specials. So do your specials change daily, weekly? Do they get driven by the weather? Do they get driven by what was on MasterChef the night before? Do they get driven by what customers are there that day? So the simple answer is, it depends. So what you're fundamentally dealing with is a complex problem. So the fundamental answer to that question is, you tell your staff, place the baskets at the end of each aisle, come back in 10 minutes time, if the baskets are still there, it's the wrong place. So what you're fundamentally dealing with is how to deal with a complex problem. And right throughout my career, I've kind of been fascinated by how do you deal with problems which are kind of these intractable, complex, wicked problems. At about 2008, I stumbled upon, in sort of my research, a thing called the Kinevin Framework. And, and this a guy that invented it is a guy called Dave Snowden. And it came out of the IBM complexity um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And basically what I'm going to do today is introduce you to the different parts of the Kinevin Framework and relate it to how we solve problems in organisations. So Kinevin is a Welsh word, and basically it means sort of habitat, but, but sort of about a place of belonging. So there are different parts that we belong in on different factors. So it's kind of based on different domains and different places. So the Kinevin framework is basically these four domains, and I'm going to talk through kind of the three of them and then spend a bit of time on the complex space. So the first sort of domain that they identified is simple. So in a simple domain, you have a direct link between cause and effect. If I do A, I will always get B. So that's the simple space. The next space is the complicated space. And in a complicated space, there's a relationship between cause and effect, but you need to do some analysis in between. So you still have a relationship between A and B, it just requires expert analysis to understand what that relationship is. Then you start getting into the complex problems. So complex problems have a cause and effect that are only knowable after the event. So after something happened, you can go back and go, oh, I now understand. But if you stopped and ran the tape again, you get a different response. So you cannot work out what the, what the answer or the solution is going to be when you start off. You can only do it in hindsight. And the last box is called chaotic, which is there is no relationship between cause and effect. It is just chaos. There's nothing that you can do. And basically the concept I want to talk about today is about understanding what kind of problems that you're trying to address and making sure you use the right tools to solve those. And simply put, in organisations, we treat complex problems using complicated tools. So how do we actually understand the complex space and how do we use the right tools to solve it? So the simple domain, as I said, cause and effect is known. If you do A, you get B. And the kind of way that you deal with that is sense, categorise, respond. So what that means is you see what's coming in, you make it fit to a predetermined set of criteria you already have, and then you decide what to do because of that. So if you think about something like a service desk, call comes in, they categorise what kind of problem it is, and if they can, they solve it straight away. So this is where you have best practice, standard operating procedures, rules and regulations. So the whole point here is you develop those rules, you make them clear to people, and then you monitor compliance. Now, in organisations, we actually have very few simple problems. Um, most of what we deal with is more complicated. But the key here is, if it is simple, and it's known, and there are only one or two answers, then make sure you have rules and regulations to follow. Example for me would be your expense process. In most organisations, there's a very consistent process for how you do expenses. So there are rules, there are regulations, there are one or two right answers, you follow the rules. The second domain is complicated. 
So as I said, complicated is the area of the expert. So this is about analysis and data and doing all that sort of good stuff. <clears throat> so here the answer is sense, analyze, respond. So again, it comes in, but you've got to go and do some work to find out what the answer is. So this is the domain of Lean, Six Sigma, process improvement, business re-engineering. So <clears throat> good practice, expert analysis, there's, there's a right answer. So with the right analysis, you can get to the right answer. So again, the key in this sort of stage is to make sure the problem you're dealing with is one of these. Because often what we do is we treat complicated problems when they're actually complex problems. So that's complicated. I'm going to move down here to the, to the left-hand box of chaotic. So often in organisations we talk about chaos. This is kind of the step above that. So this is absolutely no correlation between cause and effect. And here, the basic answer is you've got to do something. So do something, anything to, to try and stabilise the situation. So this would be, you know, the day after a, um, a bushfire, you know, Christchurch earthquake. You've just got to do something. You can't think about it, you can't analyse it, you can't understand it, you've just got to do something. So <clears throat> there are very few situations in organisations that are purely chaotic, according to the Kinevin framework. But simple, it's about command and control, you push it into one of the other domains to sort out. And then we get to the one that I'm going to focus on about complexity. So complex spaces are where there is no right answer when you begin. So you only know the cause and effect after you've done it. Unpredictable problems, no right answers, multiple solutions, variability, unstable, in this term of unknown unknowns. You don't know what's going to happen. Think back to the shopping basket. There are a million factors that influence what people are going to buy. You can't analyse it to find the answer, because there is no answer. So fundamentally you have to realise that you're dealing with a complex problem. Anything that involves human behaviour is a complex problem. Leadership, culture, values, innovation, creativity are all complex problems. But I would imagine that when we look at what we're doing, we're solving them using complicated tools. So what do I do in a complex space? What's different? Probe, sense, respond. So simply put, this is about experimenting. You don't know what's going to work. You don't know where the right place for those baskets are. So I'm going to try, and then I'm going to see whether it's worked, and then I'm going to change. I'm going to try something else, I'm going to see whether it worked, and then I'm going to change. And simply put, in terms of a change approach, you do more of what works, and you do less of what doesn't. So experiment, understand whether it's worked, keep doing more of what works, stop what doesn't. But there's a few sort of challenges in that environment. The first one is about the right mindset. There is no answer. So you can't know what to do. And in some ways that is a challenge because people look to you to go, right, you're the expert on this, what are we going to do? And the answer is, well, I'm not, I don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work. So you kind of, the answer is, I'm not sure, but I'm going to try some stuff to see what does. So people look for you as the expert to have the answer, and you cannot have the answer. But you know that you're going to try some stuff and you're going to see what works. So one is being comfortable to have the answer. I'm not sure, but we're going to find out. The second thing is about experimenting. So <clears throat> the only way that you'll know what the right approach should be is to test and learn or probe and respond or all those kind of concepts. You don't have to fail big. So trying an experiment across the entire organisation is not a good use of time or money. So how do you do small experiments in different parts of the business? But make sure that your experiment is actually testing it rather than proving that you've got the answer. Too many times when we do test and loom, we're actually just testing the assumption we've already made that's going to be the answer. So you don't know what's going to work, so you're going to try some stuff. So if you do something like the values program, you might try leader-led, team leader briefings in one part of the business. You might try a scorecard driven in another part. You might try something else somewhere else. Each one of those may be a way to create people to understand and live the values. But you don't know the answer because it's a complex problem. So how do you know if it's going to work or not? So you put a place in an experiment, how do you actually know whether you're, it's going to be a success or not a success? You've got, to go, you've got to get out from behind your desk and go and observe behaviours. So the first thing you need to do is, well, what would I know if this was working? So my wife works in direct marketing, and they do this constantly when they're trialling and testing a campaign. So they will have five or six different brochures five or six different quality of paper, images, 
and they will send it out to five or six different groups, and their measurements will be things like an increased number of hits on the website, an increased number of applications. So they would have ways of knowing which of those five or six are more effective. So when we do experiments, how do we know whether we would see a difference? And Gemba is a term that comes out of Lean and Six Sigma about go see, you know, observe the behaviour, go and watch it. Another way here is to collect stories. So what are the stories that are coming out around what people are doing? So often in this example, in a small scale experiment, um, you can't look for the achievement of the outcome. You might look for signs that the outcome might be achieved. So what are the early signs to show that it might be working or not working? So experimentation fundamentally enables you to go back out and see what's changed, what are people talking about, what's different in what they do. And the simple answer is, if it works, do more of it. If it doesn't, stop it. So in, in complexity language, the first is called amplify. So the stuff that works, you turn up, and the stuff that doesn't, you turn down. Now, that probably sounds easier than it is. You know, because in some ways, as an expert on change, it's very difficult to stop something that you think works or used to work in something else. You know, you're dealing with loss aversion where you've tried something and you've invested in it, so the ability to switch it off does not sound as, as easy as it said. But fundamentally, if it has not worked in that context on that problem, try something else. I love this term simplexity, which is basically complex mindset, simple actions. Often in complex spaces, people think you've got to have complex solutions when fundamentally it's not. It's about trying simple stuff and seeing what works. Shopping baskets, different locations. The other one I would say is that one of the ways to deal with complexity is just to get out of people's way. So sometimes you don't need to do anything. Sometimes by having a clear vision or a clear purpose of what you're trying to achieve, you treat them like adults and they work it out themselves. We spend far too much time providing direction from when sometimes we don't have to. So an example for me was I used to live in London for nearly 10 years and I lived near Victoria Underground Station. So Victoria, anyone ever been to Victoria Underground Station? This is how many people go through Victoria Underground Station every year. Right? The average is about 400,000 people a day. When I first came to London, it used to freak me out every time I went home to try and get out from the tube out the exit to get home. Right? And at the time I was doing a lot of stuff around Lean and Sigma and all that sort of process improvement. And I'd often think about how you could make that better. You know, more exits here, they could cut off part of the you know, concourse at different times of the day. And then what I fundamentally realised was, it's a complex problem. When you involve crowds, it's very, very difficult to treat that like a complicated problem. You can't analyse it and get a set of answers. Because fundamentally, 87.4 million people got off the train and got home. So it works. So all I actually had to do was change my mindset, my behaviour. The process couldn't be improved, I just had to be aware of the patterns and behaviours. And what I kind of identified was there's two behaviours that had to occur. Right? Somebody walk towards you, don't bump into them, and head in the general direction of the exit. Right? So, you know, again in complex theory it's avoidance and attraction. So sometimes you've actually just got to get out of people's way and treat them like adults to work it out themselves. Sometimes there is no answer. You know? Putting another exit into Victoria Tube Station would have cost millions of pounds and all the disruption when fundamentally everybody still got home. So takeaways for today. The first thing is make sure you're solving the right problem with the right approach. Too often in organisations we solve complex problems using complicated tools. And I'll give you a little example. So the company I used to work for did some work around collecting stories around mine safety and a company that did mine safety. And what they discovered was they mapped um, the problems against the Kinevin framework. So what they actually discovered was most of the problems were around mindsets, expectations, relationships, leadership behaviours. There were a few things around training and compliance, but fundamentally the problems were complex problems. When they mapped them against their current programs, complicated. So they were basically trying to solve a complex problem using complicated tools, and it does not work. You cannot have the answer when you start off dealing with a complex problem. No matter how much analysis you do, no matter how many times you work out the factors that influence baskets in shopping centres, fundamentally it's the wrong kind of problem. Any problem that deals with human behaviour, leadership, values, culture, innovation, creativity, is a complex problem. You cannot have the answer. So you have to be more comfortable living with 
complexity and what it entails. So what I would challenge you to do is in your next project meeting, in your next team meeting, take the problems that you are working on and map them to those four domains. And I will guarantee that you will have some in complicated, but most of your problems around getting people to do things will be in complex. Then start thinking about what do we need to do differently? How do we try some stuff and experiment? How do we see what works? So complex problems, be comfortable with not having the answer. The, the answer you will hear from me most often is, it depends. If you hear it depends, it's a complex problem. Do lots of experiments, small stuff. So an example would be, you know, we're trying an enterprise change to focus on customer centricity and change management. That's a complex problem. We don't know what that looks like. So we're going to try lots of different stuff and see what works. We don't have the answer for how you create a customer centric change function. So we're going to try stuff and see. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't, don't do it. Just because it worked on your last project doesn't mean it's going to work on this one. And the last thing is, just get out of people's way. Sometimes provide people with the outcome, provide people with the vision, and then leave them alone. So that's kind of the, the tips. So, <coughs> summary, make sure that you are dealing with the right kind of problems, with the right tools to solve those problems.